That is deafening. Deafening. The trumpets have spoken. Why don't we all come on back? I'd like to uh, welcome you all to Africa and beyond. And thank you all very much for coming. And um, I'm going to give a little talk about the art of money and uh, these magnificent shapes and forms of what the Africans used as currency once upon a time. So if we head back this way, this is, this is the money pit. <laughs> Come back. Well, welcome everybody and thank you very much for coming to our event this evening. Money makes the world go round. As you know, I know we are doing 15% of all the proceeds of the, uh, this exhibit to the Foundation for Women. And we have Deborah Lindholm here tonight. She's the, uh, the, the, the head honcho of the Foundation for Women. They do amazing work in microfinancing in Africa, microcredit loans to people in need in Africa. And we thought, as you know, we'd like to tie all our exhibits into a charity. And uh, this time, since it's a currency exhibit, we thought microcredit was a logical marriage. So uh, we're really happy to help. I'll have Deborah talk a little bit after me to let, let you know about the wonderful work that they do. Um, but anyway, all these pieces on the table and on this back wall and these iron objects behind me and even these blades here that look like they might have been for give me the money were actually <laughs> money. This was used as currency by various cultures in Africa. Um, in ancient times, this is long before money was introduced. So we're talking hundreds, of, you know, hundred, hundred years plus ago. Um, our money was intrinsically worthless to them. You know, when Europeans arrived and you know had coins and paper, and Africans were like, <laughs> "You want what for that? That's not worth a thing to them." Uh, which is why the trade beads. You know, we all know those beautiful Miyagiore trade beads were introduced by Europe. That was Europe's answer to to money to trade in Africa, because the Africans loved the color and the, the beauty of those trade beads. But the, the money in Africa was worth its weight in the, the metal. The iron objects, the copper, is what was valuable to them. So um, these are different forms of currency from different cultures. This is probably the oldest of the money. It dates back to the you know, 1600s and earlier. It's, it's kind of the precursor to a lot of the iron currencies. And I've always been very impressed with the Africans' ability to forge the iron into these beautiful shapes and forms. But it's really beyond that. It's the ability to smelt iron. You, know, you can literally melt an earth to make iron. Now there weren't many blacksmiths or many people in Africa who knew how to do that. So the blacksmiths in the, in the, in the, in the tribal groups that knew how to do that did very well for themselves. Because the, um, the, the neighboring tribes who needed the iron um, could trade for brides, could trade for cattle, could trade for land, that kind of thing. Um, and in turn, they could use that to melt down and make farming implements for weapons. So it, it's the iron itself that was, that was worth a lot of money. Um, you know, people are now investing in gold. Everybody wants something tangible. Well, for the Africans, this was something tangible. And I think we're kind of returning to that, that way of thinking. Now, you know, it, it's something for us all to wrap our head around, because I've had people coming in all week since we've started putting the exhibit up saying, what do you mean this is money? This is, you know, they're, they're thinking, how do you get this in your pocket? How do you carry this isn't exactly small change? What do you mean you carry this around? And it's, well, no, they didn't need money all the time. They only needed it when they got married, when they, when they needed land, when they wanted capital, when they wanted crops. It was used just every now and then as a major, for major transactions. Uh, we also had back here some of the currencies from other cultures um, in Papua New Guinea and what have you. But this was also a form of money in Africa, it was a seashell. Now, people who lived Inland, didn't know what a seashell was. So people who lived at the coast had plenty of shells and would trade with the people in there and say, well, phew, these are very rare. You know, I got one of these shells, a little bit of a cow. Come on, you know, this is something special. And of course, if you were inland, you'd never seen one in your life, so you thought, wow, that's got to be something special. Uh, and the saying, how much did you shell out for that, comes from people using seashells as money. Um, in fact, Somebody pointed out to me earlier that you know things like sea salt, salt was used as trade. And the Tuareg and the Manic people in the South Sahara would travel from Timbuktu and into the, into the Sahara Desert to trade and get salt and bring back in you know, horrific conditions. I mean, they talk sort about of working in a salt mine. I mean, that's uh, you know, you're worth your salt. You know, it's um, it all dates back to the sayings when salt and shells and whatever you use. Um, 
I would like to ask you if you have any questions because I can carry on and on and on talking. But I, uh, yeah, another thing that I should say is that sometimes these currencies were then transformed into use to be able to be worn. Um, you know, things like this were from the uh, Bole people in the Congo. There's a book on currency called The Perfect Form, and this is on the cover. And it, isn't it just the perfect form? I mean, the shapes and the forms of these currencies is what amazes me. And the, and, the, and the blacksmith's ability to forge these into such beautiful shapes. However, the lucky bride would get to wear one of these on each other. So uh, they say it's to keep it from running away. And uh, I think it probably did its job quite well. I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. Um, in the meantime, I'll show you this. This was from another ethnic group in the Congo called the Ikonda. Now, the Ikonda were master smiths. One of these on each ankle. <laughs> Imagine that. So yeah, that was also worn as a as a form of currency. But um, here's a terrible photocopy that I found in an old book that had been published, showing them wearing those circular copper anklets. So not exactly uh, too comfortable, but at the same time, it was. It was a badge of honor, you know, you, you had two of those. It's like somebody found me worthy to wear two of these, look at me. Plus it's good for the definition of my calves. <laughs> my leg muscles, but yeah, so a lot of it would actually be transformed and worn. So some of these blade objects that we see back here, um, you know, for example, these, they call them execution swords. And I can show you all pictures of how these were actually used for executions. Um, but they were really a, a, a symbol of power and leadership and authority and status symbols. So a lot of them were really carried as a, a badge of honor. You know, this showed that you were a big shot, you, 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 you were elevated Absolutely. to a certain status. Um, this knife here, for example, is called an iku. And this is literally translated means knife of peace. This is from the Kuba people in the Congo. Now, the Kuba is really a collective name of about 17 ethnic groups that live together in the Congo. The people that, you know, one group does hunting, one group does fishing, one group does farming, it, it, it's quite unique in that they work together as a communal system. Usually it's very trial and there the two shall meet. But the people who rule over the Kuba are called the Bouchon. And they rule, that's what they do for a living. <laughs> um, Bouchon means the people of lightning. And they got that name because of a very frightening weapon, which I have in the, the O case back there. I put it behind glass because I don't want people handling those things. Very but it's multi-blade. You look at it, it's blade going this way, blade going this way, whatever. They were throwing knives. But you can imagine the horror of those in warfare. If that thing came at you, it was called lightning, a shongo, because it looked like lightning coming at you because it, the sun would glint off of it. Plus the way it gyrated, the trajectory would zigzag across that because you had no idea <laughs> where it was coming from. Um, and it would make that sound like a boom roar, like woof, 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 coming at you. And, you know, you can imagine those blades going every which way. One of them was going to get to you and it was going to get to you severely. Um, however, there was a king of the Kuba who decided that enough of this nonsense, no more warfare, uh, we now banned that and came up with the Akul, which was the, uh, the mouth of peace. And I think with all the horror of war still going on in this world in the 21st century, we should honor that king <laughs> and enjoy the knife of peace, the Akul. Um, <coughs> and also um, pay homage to, to Liberia. Yesterday, two women from Liberia were won the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah. She faces re-election on Tuesday, and we just pray that she uh, gets re-elected. She's done an amazing, amazing job in Liberia. This here was money in Liberia once upon a time. And in fact, on their money today, they, uh, oh, where is it? There it is there. they printed on their money a, a copy of the the old currency, kind of as a memory of the ancient money that they used to have. So it's, you know, something interesting from that area. Very interesting shapes and forms. So we, we pray for Liberia and hope it gets back after so many 15, 16, 17 years of civil war, it's getting back on track. Um, but anyway, any questions, please? I'm, I can carry on all night. <laughs> What do you mean this is money? How, how is this money? But, you know, like said, a lot of it would, would replicate, yeah. you know, farming implements and things like that. Absolutely. Yeah. How did you get interested in this, Ian, and how long has it been since you started collecting these pieces? Um, I started collecting currency pieces about 25